Welcome back to Uncaged from Talk Sport, your official review of UFC 301 plus everything else that is going on in the world of MMA. I'm Adam Catterall, pleasure to be with you, pleasure to be with this young man who is back in camp already for his next fight in the PFL, the one, the only, featherweight king, Mr. Brennan Lochnane. How are you, buddy? You good? Yeah, good, mate. Landed last night. I don't just get an acclimatise. Another eight weeks of uh, fun coming up. Yeah, back to back again. You see, people watching this show, they'll be thinking, hang on a minute, he's only just had a fight. He's fighting again. That's the PFL, baby. Keeps on rolling, doesn't it? You know what it is? Yeah, I said to all these people now, we've got a 70% new roster in the PFL. And I said, let's see where they all are, fight free August. Let's see where everyone's at on the third weight cup. Black eyes, going into camp, smashed up faces. It's not easy, Adam. Only the strong survive over here, lad. Experience, my friend. Experience. Ready to rock and roll. Um, how much was your mouth salivating at some of those fights that we saw at the weekend at UFC 301 in Rio de Janeiro? On paper, it might not necessarily have been the sexiest with the biggest of names, but geez, man, it didn't half deliver for the Brazilian people. No, it was fantastic, but I was a bit upset about our local lads. You know, I know we'll get onto that, but I was upset for our two pals, especially uh, especially the one that we had on here just before the fight, you know, Paul. So. It was a bit upsetting from that angle, mm. but from the other angle, you know, we looked up down the card, I thought it could have been better, but it did produce some great finishes and loads of talking points. Brilliant night for Brazilian fighters on the main card in particular, four and one. That one being Anthony Smith, of which we're going to come back to in a minute. Jeez, what a fantastic victory for him. But first and foremost, flyweight titles on the line. Alexandre Pantoja uh, defending against Steve Ersig. Steve Ersig, the number 10 ranked flyweight going into the fight. It was kind of a last man standing. It was either him or more Moche of getting that title shot, seeing as that Pantoja has kind of wiped out the division already, and it was Ursig that got the shot. It got a little bit of criticism from a lot of MMA media and fans worldwide, but my word, Steve Ursig, he might have got in there as the number 10 ranked. He won't be coming out number 10 ranked, even though he loses the fight. Lots of credit. Here's my first question, putting you right on the spot, my man, because it's a blooming tight fight to score this. Did the right man win? I think so. I think, Adam, you have to take the title from the champion. It's that old saying, in it? You've got a definitively win every round, clearly. And I think Pantoja did just, just enough. What about yourself? I think the right man did win. What you've just said there, that it kind of irks me a touch that. Because when, a tight, when it's a title fight, I hear that all the time. You've got to go and beat, you've got to beat the champion more than you would have to necessarily beat somebody else that isn't the champion. I personally think that when there's a title fight, that title becomes vacant, goes up into the sky, and two guys fight. Whoever wins that is absolutely worthy of taking that title away and becoming the new champion. But I agree with what you've said regarding the scoring of the fight. I think there's two definitive rounds. First one is definitely a Pantoja round. The fourth one is definitely a Steve Ersig round. The rest of it, geez, man, you've got to get your criteria book out and you've got to be looking at it absolutely fine yeah. tooth comb because these guys are going at it. Urseg brought it and he brought it in ways that I didn't think that he was going to bring it. His stand-up was absolutely sensational. His jab was on point. He was brilliant in the scrambles, which we all know that he's a great grappler. And he really asked some big questions of the champion, Alexandre Pantoja. But maybe an experience cost him because he... He zigged when he maybe should have zagged in certain rounds. He did things at certain times yep. that got himself in a little bit of bother. And Pantoja lapped that up. That experience kind of told. And Pantoja did what Pantoja always does, man. You know he's a dog. He digs deep, doesn't he? He goes to the well. He's prepared to go to the well on many, many occasions. And he absolutely had to do that at certain points in that fight. And I think it was 2-2 for me going into the final round. And I think Pantoja just ekes that out in the fifth round, mainly based on a Steve Ersig mistake, mate. He'll come again, though, Ersig. No doubt about it. He's a top contender. I mean, yeah, his stock <clears throat> for sure rose up in that fight. Um, but I'm going to challenge you on that, uh, that point about taking the title from the Go champion. Because like you said, right, OK, we've got a reigning champion here who's beat, cleared out the division, all right? If there's anyone that deserves a little bit of leeway in the scoring. It's the champion because they've done enough to be there, to get there. They got the belt. They're the champion. So if we've got a close fight, you have to lean towards the champion, Adam. You have to. Why? Why? Be because they are the champion at the end of the day. They're the one. They're the red corner. They yeah, are but the that's guy. history. I'm talking about... But that's history, isn't it? Close, that, that's, that's what like they've, it that, yeah, but that's what they've done in a previous fight. All those things of what... Pantoja, there's no doubt about it. 
at the moment, he's the guy in the flyweight division. As I said, he's wiped out the majority yeah. of the division. But this is a separate fight. In fact, you've got five separate fights within the fight, haven't you? You've got to score each round individually. Yeah. The judges shouldn't be looking at them going, well, he's the champ, so I'm going to favour him. It should be two individuals who's doing the most clean, effective work, who's causing the bother. And if you cause, if this guy's causing just a little bit more bother than this guy, he should be winning. Yeah, good point. But like you said, like to go back, we we were razor close on the decision, weren't we? We were razor. Yeah, he, he was. zigged when he should have zagged. So the right man did get the decision. But I definitely get your points. I do, 100%. Each round should be scored clearly. Who won that round should win the fight. But the age-old saying, it comes from boxing, you've got to lead towards the champion. And that's kind of what they did in this fight. Because it could have gone either way. I do agree with you on that. But... Is this a sign of Steve Erstick coming up or is this a sign of Pantoja slowing down? Like, it's one of them now. I think Pantoja's been question. champion for a hell of a long time. Hell, hell of a long time. If that was Marvin Mokhaev in there, where would we have been at? Do you know what I mean? I mean, it was a very, very close fight. There was some very good transitions in there. And I do think the younger guys are starting to come. Now, what's Pantoja now? 33? 30, yeah, 33. Uh, 34. In, in 34. The... Yeah, yeah. He's coming up to that age now where... <laughs> That 35-year-old cut-off in those lower weight divisions, you know what At I mean? At the flyweight division, to... Adam, you just don't see it. You don't see 35-year-old flyweights, really, do you? So maybe it's a case of, you know, the young lads are ca catching him up now, Pantoja, and it's going to be exciting to see what happens with that division. Do you know something? That's really interesting, the way that you frame that, because I saw it as Ursig just coming out of nowhere and really surprising everybody. But maybe, maybe there is that, you know, just closing of the gap, so to speak. What I will say from an Ursig point of view... UFC are going to Perth at UFC 305. He has to be on that card. Australian kid, yeah, he's got to be in front of the home fans. And I was trying to think of who you would put him in against. For me, next in line for Pantoja is Mo Mokhaev. He's the guy, right? But are they yeah. going to give Mo one maybe in Manchester against Roy Val as an eliminator to maybe justify that spot? Maybe. Can Pantoja turn it round? What, when does Pantoja want to go again? All these questions are now up in the air for the flyweight division. From an Ursig point of view, why not do like a battle of down under against Kai Kara France or uh, Amir Al Bazi or something Ooh. like that? You know what I mean? Give him a monster yeah. fight, stick him on the main card in yes. Perth and let him go and do his thing because the kid has absolutely earned the spotlight. Oh, my mouth salivating at the thought of Kai Kara France versus Ursek in Perth. What a fight oh. that is. You just put it together, Adam. You've just put it together. Let's, Let's do it. Steve, listen, we'll put it out to the universe. Let's do it. Now, two years off, my friend. Drinking from the Peter Pan Fountain of Youth. Benjamin Button, the old King of Rio himself. He rolled it back, mate, didn't he? We thought that Martinez and that front foot pressure wow. might just be too much. 13 ranked, young buck, getting himself a legend, gone, become a superstar. Josie Aldo was having none of it, mate. Came out sharp, crisp, right from the off. I think every fighter now is going to be looking at taking a two-year break and going into the world of boxing for a bit because normally it's all about the kicks, isn't it? His hands were absolutely outstanding, mate. You must have been loving that. That's right up your street. Joe, you know what? I was a little bit worried, right? Because I seen uh, I seen Jose Aldo checking in for the weigh-in on the Tuesday, and he looked gone. His face mm. looked gone, and I thought, you know, he's had all that time off. Has he put more weight on? Is it harder to get it off? His age, and also, like, I know what it's like to take time off and try and get back down to a certain weight. So I did, I seen it, I was worried, and I thought, oh, God, I hope, I hope Jose Aldo doesn't go out on his shield. You know, one of them ones, like, is yeah. this he's going out on his shield in Rio? I thought, is this what he's going to do? Did he read the script? No, he didn't. He came out better than ever, sharp, off the jab. I mean, he doesn't even use the kicks anymore. He's like, he used to be known for kicks and blasting people's legs clean off. And he just thought, you know what, I'm going to turn into a pro boxer now instead. Incredible, the way he was mixing the takedowns in, Jose Aldo looked better than ever and we might have a new guy in that division who doesn't want to see O'Malley and Aldo or something after that who doesn't do you know so the, the possibilities now are absolutely endless because it's Jose Aldo Insane. because he's a legend everybody else will be going I'll have a dance with him because it's a credible Jose yeah. Aldo's always going to be credible but I'm talking about credible level he's just put in a performance against a young book number 13 in division he said nah man I ain't no gatekeeper and I'm going to school you and he 30 27 did yeah. so now you're cool looking him. What comes up next for Jose Aldo? He's talking about, I want to have a run at the title. It's kind of believable because of who he is. Sean O'Malley would probably fancy that. Personally, let's see if we can get Dom Cruz fit. If we can get Dom oh, Cruz yeah. fit, let's do yeah, Jose yeah. Aldo. Let's do it this year. And then who knows? One of them legends could rise once again and then maybe set it up for a title shot.
No, that is the that is the fight to make in it. I mean, Dom will be coming off what? Dom will probably be three years at that point, won't he? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like I, I think best featherweight versus best was, bantamweight of all time. Let's go. Yeah, for sure. But if I was Dom, I'd be looking for a warm up now before I get in there with Ozzy. <laughs> so we, hey, Ozzy Aldo looked like he'd rolled back ten years, didn't he? Yeah. Honestly, he looked absolutely insane, and I think. He's definitely thrown himself in the mix again. Guys like Peter Yan again. Imagine a Peter Yan rematch. Oh, oh, Come on, man. think about it, mate. What what we could do with this division now. Mate, there could be, like you've just said there, when he when he came down to Bantamweight, there were a couple of fights there that didn't go his way and he was just feeling his way yeah. into that division. He's a completely yeah. different dude now after what we saw at the weekend. Maybe rematch some of them, like you've just said. Peter Yan could be the one. Oh, that would be... That Strap. would be what a fight that would be to watch again now, especially after the way he's come back. I was a bit worried after taking time off, going to boxing. Then I was hearing that he had one fight left on his contract yeah. and he was just seeing that out. I didn't know what, what kind of mind frame he was in, but after seeing it, it's a hungry Jose Aldo who's going back for the belt. Great to see. Fantastic to see. Um, where are you at with Michel Pereira's backflips? Love it. I love it. I know, I know it was semi-illegal. Listen. What? Listen, listen. It's either illegal or it's not illegal, right? You can't have semi-illegal. It's a gray area. Semi it's, a it's, gray a gray area. area. It's, a, it's a gray area, Adam. For those That's that don't right. know what Brother's referring to, the backflip, he has struck a <laughs> rounded opponent in the mush, right? He hasn't done it. Kind he hasn't of. gone clean. It's kind of grazed kind him. Of. It's, it is, it's an illegal shot. It's accidental, obviously. He can't have planned to have landed it there. That's what you're referring to. But the entertainment value from Michel Pereira is just wow. off the charts, man. How can you not love watching that guy? Wow. We talked about this. You know when we, you know when we previewed the card? And I yeah. said, that's the guy I want to see. Like, that's the guy I always want to see. Up and down that card. Incredibly exciting. Takes risks, Adam. You've got guys that'll just come out and sit behind the jab because they want to get a win bonus. This guy's doing backflips. And doing whatever he wants in there. He doesn't care about losing position. Doesn't care about stomping you in the head on the floor. Like He just don't care. He just goes through it, doesn't he? And I think we need more guys like this guy. This guy is insane to watch. I loved watching him fight. The passing guard with a back, a rear backflip is something insane. they don't teach you on the jiu-jitsu mats, let me tell you. That is just pure capoeira creativity for Michel Pereira. And just on the, the strike, right? Because I saw loads of people online saying, oh, it should be overturned, it should be no contest. Listen, I get it. I get what you're saying. But give the guy his moment. We want creativity, don't we? We want creativity in the sport. We want entertainment. The dude has done what he's done. He's obviously not on purpose. I personally do not believe that that's, that strike, if we're going to call it that, yeah. changes any momentum in that fight. The the, the stand-up strikes have obviously dropped Pacheria. He's at the deck. He's passed guard with his crazy backflip. And then the rest of it has kind of played out how I think it was always going to play out. A standing guillotine choke as well to finish. Give Pereira his credit. He's eight undefeated now in this division. Oh right, nice. Let's get him. Let's get him a big one. Let's get him. Uh, Did you want to see him against next one? Well, this is interesting, right? Because there's a conversation about him and what I'm, we're about to talk about with Caio Baio, who's, who's just beaten Paul Craig, right? Both in the same division, both doing extremely well, both Brazilians. And there's a few fights knocking about there, right? I kind of like. I kind of for but for these two where they're ranked, I kind of like the loser of maybe Paulo Costa and Sean Strickland. You could even bring in a Brendan Allen, who's just done a brilliant job on Chris Curtis, who he, who was also beat Paul Craig. You've also got Roman yeah. Delidze. There's a couple of guys there yeah. in between five and ten that you could throw in the mix with these lads, and I don't think they'll be out the depth. He just honestly, one more thing that we previewed. How about the size of him, mate? He's a giant. How mate. about the size? It's none of it's making sense. I'd love to know what this guy's weight cut protocol is because. He's an absolute giant, isn't it? Hey, just remember, he fought Danny Roberts at welterweight. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. And even when you see him in the next division, you're like, how? He's giant. He's an absolute giant. He's an anomaly, isn't he? Yeah. He's an absolute anomaly. The way he fights, the size of him, his charisma. I love everything about this guy. The UFC needs more fighters like this. Yeah, I agree. Um, obviously, disappointment for Paul Craig. Um, but yep. 
we've got to be brutally honest. I, I the, the game plan was wrong. You can't stand in front of someone like Kyle Barayo no. and expect him not to smack you clean in the face. His striking is so crisp, so beautiful from that wide yeah. karate stance. And he kind and Paul kind of played into the hands of Kyle. It's a great signature win for Kyle. I want him to go on to bigger and better things because he's got everything that you've just been talking about there regarding the charisma and the style. And I think he's one of those yeah. underrated stars of this division. Gutted for Paul, but I think he played right into Kyle's hands. Yeah, I agree. I think um, I was a bit worried about the matchup when I first seen it and it, it kind of went the way that I thought it might have gone. Do you know what I mean? I mean, Kyle is definitely the dark horse of that division. He's uh, he's extremely dangerous everywhere, great on the ground, ferocious striker yeah. and hungry. And I could see him eventually going for the title very soon. In fact, like the way he's moving now, I think he's a tough man to beat. He really is. Yeah. Uh, final one on this card, and it's the one that went the way that maybe none of us saw going because we were kind yeah. of marketing, and I think the majority of the world were marketing Anthony Smith as the gatekeeper of the division, <sighs> taking on Vito Petrino, who was 11 undefeated going into the fight. He was supposed to be the next big thing coming out of Brazil, and I'm sure he will go on to achieve magnificent things because for large percentages of this fight, he looked really good against Anthony Smith. But, again, like we said in the, in the main event, experience counts. Anthony Smith just waited for the moment. And when the moment presented itself, an elite grappler like that is not going to pass up on that neck. And he took it and he cashed his check. Brilliant for Anthony Smith. He needed it, mate. Because he was in a little bit of a sticky spot. He needed it. And now he can start to push forward again. I mean, Anthony Smith is... Is he not the most experienced guy in the division? If not, he's definitely up there. And he's 57 the pro guys. MMA fights. There we go. There we go. What does that tell you? That guy knows his way around a cage. Do you know what I mean? Like, he can put these young up-and-comers. Look at Jim Miller. Jim Miller's yeah. another one. Look at the guys that he's beat in his career because there's just something about cage time. If you actually add up how many hours yeah. Anthony Smith has been in the cage, it's hours and hours and hours in there, feet on the ground, range, knows everything. And to be honest, it was a mistake as well. It was a pretty simple mistake. And he dived on the guillotine. And Bruce Buffer nearly took his moment away. How about that? Listen, how it, about that bit? Even Buff was surprised at the result, wasn't he? He'd already pre, he'd already pre-written the result. It was a rare Buffer L, wasn't it? <laughs> Anthony took it well, though. It I think great. the majority of the world was probably yeah, thinking that Petrino would come through that fight. But brilliant for Anthony Smith. That's just the beauty of MMA, man. You never know. We can read stuff on paper. We can look at facts and stats. We can look at the way people are currently performing from their last fights. But any given moment, mad things can happen. And Anthony Smith proved that he is still one of the top boys in the light heavyweight division. No doubt about that. I reckon a few parlays went down. I reckon Vegas are a big fan of Anthony Smith right now. Do you? Yeah, absolutely, mate. Listen, mine went down as well. Anyway, let's move on, <laughs> shall we? <laughs> let's move what, on. Your block picks, go on. Yeah, all gone. Let's go on to um, the featured prelim because this is going to upset us, no doubt about it, because I cannot, for the life of me, even now thinking about it, come to the conclusion that that fight should have been stopped in the way that it should have been stopped. I'm, of course, referring yeah. to Joannes and Brito against um, Jack Shaw. It's a fight that Brito is, in, I say, in control of. He's winning. He won the first round. I think he's winning the first two minutes of that second round. Jack Shaw's still in the fight, though. And then we get this mad yeah. moment where I'll put it down to an inexperienced doctor. He's asked his opinion on, on a moment of the fight and it's waved off. I feel for Jack because you put in all that work in your, in your camp. You know that you're going to be yeah. up against it. You're fighting a Brazilian in Brazil. But you expect to be allowed to fight and determine the outcome of the fight yourself. Yeah, it'd be heartbroken now, Jack. Um, you know, going over to Brazil and taking on someone like that in his own back garden it's not an easy task for anyone and then for it to end the way it ends you don't you know when you go to places like brazil you're going out on your shield aren't you listen i'm going over there i'm going into the lion's den and i'm having it he didn't really get the chance and you know jack is one of them fighters that does get better as the fight goes on and i could have seen a better end to the second and a good start to the third for jack so unfortunate ending but this is mma man like you said it is Gutted for him. I'll tell you what, roll it back. Let's see if both lads can be fit for UFC 304 in Manchester. Eh? Bring them up. Bring them over this Let's side. Let's go. Let's have bring a Bring Jack dance. Shaw over, lad. Absolutely. Give Jack Shaw a fight at least, even if it's not with the Brazilian. Let's just get at least Jack Shaw on that card. 
terrible ending. And Jack Shaw, what a fighter to watch. You know, what a set of balls to even go over there and do what he did. Same to Paul Craig. Good lads. Fair play to you. Didn't go your way, but they went over there and they give it the best go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and referee, sorry, doctors shouldn't be guessing whether a leg is broken, especially when the fighter's <laughs> still walking on the leg, right? He's oh, all right, man. mate. Let him crack on. And sticking your fingers Let in the cut. Has anybody on. ever done that? I mean, you've oh. had some injuries in your time, man. Sticking fingers deep into a cut in the middle of a fight? Come on, give the kid a break. What are you doing? It was strange, Adam. I'm not going to lie to you. When I see it, I thought, what is this man doing? Who, who employed this man? What kind of doctor is he? I would, I would hate it if he was my GP, wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, just to wrap up from UFC 301 in Brazil, uh, Maurizio Jufi, who is a teammate, fights out the same gym, the fighting nerds of uh, Kyle Bahio. Um Listen, man, Dana White's bigging him up, referring to uh, his his debut as one of the best debuts uh, that we've ever seen in the UFC. I love a little bit of pomp, love a little bit of ceremony. It's it's a debut against a very credible opponent in Jamie Malarkey, who's been there, done it, got the T-shirt. Um, and exciting, man. Listen, there's been a period of time when, when, when the UFC, I suppose, initially begun. Brazilian fighters were the guys, weren't they? They were the guys. And we went for a long period of time of elite level martial arts being dominated by the Brazilians. Then, you know, we've had a little bit of a break slightly. A couple of them champions fell off. Maybe Father Time got the gist of them. And then Europe came into it. America's came into it. Other parts of the world came into it. And people from around the world started to become a little bit more dominant. Obviously, we've got Dagestan wrestlers, for example, started to become uh, the guys. But it just feels now the Brazilian MMA is coming right back around with the likes of Kayo, with the likes of uh, Maurizio Huffy. I'll tell you something, man. There's a new generation coming through. No, there is, there's a resurgence from the Brazilians because you talk about the golden era, the Anderson Silvers, Leo, Omachidas, all these. It was a period there where I'm sure we had all Brazilian champions and if not, at least 50 to 60% of it was Brazilian champions. And it felt like they fell off a bit, like you say, the Dagestan is coming. And guess who else have come through? The English, mate. Yeah, that's I mean, right. That's another problem. The English are up there as well. So, you know, if there was a league table now, like, like the Olympics, you definitely have the English, the Brazilians, the Russians. Yeah. Mm, who else would you throw in? I'll tell you what, there's been a bit of there. resurgence from down under as well. You know what I mean? With the, with yeah, the likes true. of Volt true. doing his thing. You know what true. I mean? There's your top five. And I think now it makes it exciting because martial arts is growing around the world. That just shows. It was always big in Brazil, but now it's growing globally and we're seeing resurgence from all countries now and guys popping out of nowhere with unbelievable levels of talent. It's scary to watch now, it really is. Yeah, must give a little mention as well to Africa. There were a little period of time there with Francis, Izzy, Kamaru. And now obviously we've got Drikas coming out of South Africa. It's starting to pop. It's popping all over the world, man. It's the greatest sport in the world. It's a worldwide sport and it's absolutely flying. But with that being said, let's do then. You've just mentioned some names there that's got me uh, got me thinking. Let's do our <laughs> top five, top five Brazilian fighters of all time, right? I'm trying to think if any of the new crop actually make it. And I say the new crop, the current crop. And maybe one actually does, yeah. given a performance at the weekend. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Right. Right, I've done me five. Are you ready? I've just had a look at, I've got seven names on this list, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna right, to cut go. it. I'm going to cut it. Right, you ready? Go. And this is going to upset me because everybody knows the challenges that this fighter had with, um, let's just say, USADA. (laughs) I'm putting him in at number five, multi-weight world champion. And during a time of MMA, he was ultra dominant. And what he did, he went from the heavier weight divisions down to the lower divisions. I've got to beam my bonnet with him because he hurt one of my mates and changed his life forever. But you still can't argue with the fact that... He was a sensational mixed martial artist. Peter Belfort is on number five on my list, mate. Who have you got? Number five. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I'll I'll run my top five and then you run yours. I'll run my top five. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Right. So I've got Peter Belfort in at number five. Number four. Do you know something? I'm changing it. My number four, Amanda Nunes. Wow, curveball. Multi-weight Good world choice, champion. Though. Great show. Quite choice. easily, 
for me, the greatest female martial artist of all time. Her journey to where she got to, she beat the best of the best. Anybody that was put in front of her, she slayed them. Amanda Nunes is my number four. I'm going to go Jose Aldo, number three. He's still doing it, man. 37 yeah. years of age, the greatest wait, wait, of all wait, time. Wait. You've got you got Aldo at number three. Yes, wait. Wow. Jose Aldo is my number three, best featherweight of all time. Absolutely slayed the place to pieces. Still doing yep. it at 37 years of age. Number yep. two, Hoist Gracie. Wow. I have to put him in there, man. He's the original. Now, I know that people say, well, hang on a minute. There's been better guys, a bit more well-rounded guys. There's been this, that, and the other. He's the Godfather. Man. Listen. He's the Godfather. He's the man. He started it, didn't he? Yeah, right. the Godfather. And then, in at number one, oh, man. And again, this comes back to maybe a few problems with USADA. My journey into following martial arts came through Bisping, watching Bisping on this rise. And as I'm watching Bisping, I'm watching a few other fighters that are maybe featured on Bisping's cards and what have you. And one guy stands out head and shoulders above everybody else because he was doing stuff that you see in movies, man. He yeah, was yeah, the original yeah, yeah. Mortal Kombat. He was like, who is this Bruce Lee fella over here doing yeah, all this front yeah, kick yeah. to the face type stuff? It's yeah. one and only. The Spider, Anderson Silva. I think he's the best Brazilian martial artist of all time. Okay, right. What have you got for me? Brendan's turn. And I've been thinking about this now. You've mentioned some names, and I'm going to throw two in there that you've not mentioned. Okay, so I'm going to go from top to bottom. I'm going to do it the other way around. And I'm also going to let everyone know that this is kind of my favourite mixed in with ah, the top five. Ah, look yeah. at him. Get sorry, your splinters sorry. out your backside. Look at you. You know what I mean? I'm going to take a bit of both, yeah? My personal number one, I have to agree with you. The Spider Silver, you can't oh, look any other way apart from him as the greatest Brazilian mixed martial artist of all time. Now, number two. Hmm. I'm going to have to stick Jose Aldo one up, okay. put him second. He's a tight first and second between them two because mm-hmm. I am personally a featherweight. I personally grew up on this man. I personally watched him kick the legs off Uriah Faber and batter everyone to death, and he's still doing it. So close one and two with them two. Number three, you didn't mention him, and I was quite surprised. Well, he might be my Charles, seven, but go for it. Yes. Charles Oliveira. How can you have a top five? He's fought everyone, Adam. At, in two weight classes. Legend of a man. Another one you didn't mention. Oh, I'm going to put on number four. Go on. Leo O, the Dragon Machida. Another one out of karate films. Jumping front, kicking people like when no one had ever heard of it. Absolutely. Incredible fighter. And my number five, there's a lot of controversy with it. You mentioned him too. When you take the steroids away, what kind of a man would he be? But I genuinely, truly believe that this guy was one of the greatest mixed martial artists of all time. So he has to make the top five. And that is Vitor TRT Belfort. (laughs) I actually feel dirty not mentioning Charles Oliveira in my top five because he's my favourite fighter on the planet right now. He's super, super, super entertaining. The other fighter that was part of my top seven that I flitted between him and Amanda Nunes. No, Rafael Dos Anjos. Yeah. Yeah, nah. Brilliant brilliant lightweight, but he he didn't make my top five. Nah, he didn't. He wouldn't have made mine either. I've got got to be honest with you. Look at you. But I think we're all in on the Charles Oliveira train, mate. Oh, I should have put him in. But who do I leave? I'll tell you what, Vito, you're off my top five, mate. Charles, <laughs> you're in. Yeah, you can tell him. <laughs> Listen, great top five. Brazilian fighters, like I said, they've churned out some sensational fighters over the years and they're doing it again. There's a new crop coming through as we all experienced at UFC 301. Right. Little bit of any other business. Have you seen that The Rock is training MMA? Dwayne Johnson throwing down, mate. Is he fighting for the BMF then or what? Mate, got to get him involved, don't we? Uh, I'm led to believe that he is, uh, he's obviously training for a film at the moment, mate. Um, yeah. Uh, and he is getting the nuances of martial arts to make the film look as realistic as it possibly can. Interesting, though, because we've seen wrestlers come over before, haven't we? We've seen Big Brock come and have a little bit of a do. I would love to see Dwayne Johnson 
Go on, man, just give him one. Get in there and let's have a do go. Want, do you want a fun fact about me? I reckon the only reason I'm actually a mixed martial arts fighter is because of The Rock. I grew up on The Rock and I didn't even want to be an MMA fighter. I wanted to be a wrestler. But then <laughs> MMA just kind of fell along with it. Who was who didn't want to be The Rock as a kid? Who didn't want to be The Rock? The Rock was the man. The little speedos. Can you smell what The Rock's cooking? He was my hero. I hope... I really hope we get this man in the cage at some point. Or do I, though? Would I like to see him get beat? Because it's a lot to learn. I'd put him in with another wrestler, at least. Don't be putting him with another MMA fighter, please. Listen, of all the guys that you train with around the world, and you train with some top dudes, how good would it be to train with The Rock? Yeah, incredible, incredible. You know, he actually replied to me once on Twitter, and I was like, wow, The Rock, the Rock's just replied to me on Twitter. I was a proper fanboy moment. I messaged him about his new film about 10 years ago. Love your new film. He's like, thanks, champ. Keep killing him. I was like, I sc- mate, I put it all over the media. Like, you know, the rock's <laughs> just treating me, don't you? Honestly, it's one of the greatest moments of my life. The rock. Of all the people that you know in your life, the right that you've absolutely melted yeah. with Dwayne Johnson pinging your message. Love yeah, it. Seriously. It's that deep. <laughs> oh. Right. Whilst we're still talking about the big boys in the. Uh, in the UFC and in martial arts. Little one on John Jones. Don't know what you made of this this week. Here's my, here's my theory, right? So they've had a little bit of social media back and forth. John, well, I say back and forth. John Jones is taken to social media, right? And yep. he is making the pitch for a fight with Alex Pereira, who is currently the light heavyweight champion. And he makes a lot of incredibly valid points, this John. But he knows exactly what he's doing, in my opinion. What he's doing, he's pitching a fight that there is, let's just say, an easier path to victory than the one that is stirring him clean in the face. Yes, of course. Would John Jones, Alex Pereira be exciting? Of course it flipping would. Would it sell? Absolutely. Alex Pereira becoming maybe the first ever guy in the UFC to win three simultaneous. I mean, that would be just absolutely sensational. A three-weight world champion, one of which being the heavyweight. Mate, we're all in on that narrative. But John Jones ain't daft. He knows what the threat is of Alex Pereira, and he knows that he has the skill set to be able to nullify Alex Pereira and, let's just say, take that victory. The fight that he's staring him clean in the face is Tom Aspinall. That's it. I don't want any more chat. People will come at us and say, ah, these two Brits making this noise. Nah, think about it. You've got an interim champion in your division. You're the champ. He's the interim champ. It's irrelevant who's holding it. Even if it was Sergei Pavlovich holding it, I'd still say the same thing. That yeah. is the fight to make. Clean that out, Agreed. and then you can start talking about dancing with Alex Pereira. 100% agree with you. And you know what? I feel bad on Tom. I do, because Tom just wants that fight, don't you know what I mean? For his own legacy and to prove that he's the greatest fighter out there and to fight John Jones, I mean, it's a dream for everyone, especially in the higher weight classes and test yourself against the greatest fighter to ever put a foot in a mixed martial arts cage. But I'm going to put a butt on this. Who doesn't want to see him and put it like, come on, like seriously. I know, listen, Tom's with me. Tom, I'm with you. I want to see it too. But I also want to see Padilla and I want to see John Jones get in that cage and fight. Like, come on. They are them three. Can't them three just do a round robin a few times, mate? Because I would love to see them three mix it up. Jones... Perea, Perea, Tom, just just mix it up a few times, lads. We don't, we, we'll stand back and watch. Do you know what I mean, Adam? Mate, I mean, like I said, it's an exciting fight. I think it sells. I think the world would absolutely stop to watch it. And there's there's ways of getting there. But for me, the, the way of getting there is this. John Jones fights Tom Aspinall. We find out who the number one is in the heavyweight division. That person gets to invite Alex Pereira up to the division to have a dance, right? That's the way that I think it should play out. That's the way it should be done. That's the way it should be done. we are dealing with the GOAT. We are dealing with John Jones, right? So, if John Jones signs and promises that he's going to stick around for the winner of Pereira versus Aspinall, let's do it that way around. Let's do Pereira versus Aspinall. Winner of that gets John Jones. I mean... If we're doing it in a in, in a world where everything's fair, it should be John Jones and Tom Aspinall. Everybody of course. knows that. But like you just threw in the works, we are dealing with the greatest mixed martial artist ever on the planet. And unfortunately, mate, 
whatever he says goes. <laughs> whatever he says goes. And that's that's kind of how it is right now, isn't it? He's earned them stripes. You know, like we said about, you know, champions holding rounds and, you know, leaning towards champions. When John Jones speak, we listen, unfortunately. And that's just the way it is. The same when Conor McGregor speaks. We listen. I want Michael Chandler. No, I want him at my weight. We just listen, don't we? And John Jones has earned that. You're not wrong, man. Listen, it's going to be interesting to see how all this plays out. Fingers crossed we get a date. Well, we kind of know that, I mean, according to Tom, three or four in Manchester is going to be his date, but who's going to be the person standing across from it? Imagine if they just bring in Pereira for that. Oh, mate, come on. Deal me in. Deal me in. But didn't you say it's already, he's already got everything sorted? He's got the date. He hasn't, sat, he hasn't sorted the opponent oh, as of yet. Still, still up in the air, mate. Still up in the air. Interesting. Come on, oh, the UFC. <laughs> Uh, there you have it. That was Uncaged uh, from me and him this week. Hopefully you enjoyed UFC 301. If you haven't seen any of them fights yet, go back and have a little bit of a nosy. Cracking main event between Pantoja and Erseg. Well worth checking out. Also go and check out Jose Aldo's masterclass, rolling back the years at 37 years of age. And if you fancy seeing some creative striking, go and watch Michel Pereira backflip his way through guard and then deliver a standing guillotine choke on Io Pateria in front of uh, an adoring Brazilian crowd. Sensational stuff. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. Talk sport, MMA, plenty of stuff coming up in the not-too-distant future. This man's going to go off now and get some training done ahead of his fight, which is around eight weeks away, is it? Are we eight weeks away from the next one? Eight weeks Saturday, yeah, so just under now, Adam. Time to get to work. Let's get it on. There you go. Make sure you come back to us next week as we get stuck into more MMA. Catch you next time. Thank you.